Hallelujah. We bless the Lord for he has given us life so that we can praise him and we can worship him. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. This kind God, I have never seen this type of God. Hallelujah. Amen. We bless your name, King of Kings. Amen. We worship you, Lion of Judah. Kama wera piki, ona wesa, ona wesa, 
your name the only one who rules the universe king of the universe that i am who i am yes lord yes lord it's you only you only you only you can say yes your kingdom is in my heart that's where you see Only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my heart. Only you can satisfy my soul. Only you can satisfy my heart. Jesus, call him Jesus.
Praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for this is the day the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in him. Can we please humble ourselves and we pray? Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Almighty God, everlasting King. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. For all that you do and what you shall continue to do, Father, we say thank you. For your glory and power, your goodness and mercy, Father, we say thank you. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. We counter anything contrary that wants to rise up against us during this session. Spirit of the living God, have your way. Open the eyes of our understanding that we see what you want us to see. Understand what you want us to understand. That we are not only going to be hearers of your word, that we'll be doers of your word and your name will be glorified. Father, take all the glory, take all the honor, take all the praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for his glory and power. We appreciate him for his goodness and mercy. Uh, still looking at our kingdom living principles, still under that theme of the general councils, the general councils that our Lord Jesus Christ is giving us. We are looking at Matthew chapter 6, the general councils that the Lord Jesus is giving us. And we see these general councils in Matthew Chapter 6, we have looked at a, a series of them. So today we look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. And we shall also look at Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, to wherever we shall stop. Uh, but we've started looking at the general council. So looking at this um, Matthew 6, 24, it tells us in the New King, uh, New King James Version, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I repeat, no one can serve two masters. For either he will serve, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So what does this categorize? Single-minded devotion. Single-minded devotion and service. Single-minded devotion and service. You cannot serve two masters. You must have one master. You must have a single service. So there is, the Lord is telling us that there are two masters here. We have Almighty God and we have Mammon. So this mammon spirit is from the side of the devil. And God Almighty is where our Lord Jesus Christ stems from. So this mammon is the demon of greed. Demon of greed that loves money in a way that is beyond. So he's saying you can't serve the two. There was uh, something that happened some time back. 
a gentleman got a very big contract with the World Bank. He was sent to a country where the ministry, where the church had just started being established. And the system that was set by, the structure that was set by the one who started the church was running very well smoothly. And they were very okay. This man goes because of his World Brown project and he feels that, okay, he can also run the church. So we warned them and said, no, the two can't work because all those are two big projects. The church itself is a project, beloved. <laughs> the church itself is a project. For the church to run smoothly day and night, that you wake up, you sleep, you wake up to sleep. They've not called you that tragedy has befallen, so calamity has befallen, so demon has attacked, so and so. Demon, uh, all sorts of things that have to do with, you know, the cover, praying, and all things that God has tasked and assigned. It is a project on its own. So this man came to do his job that was sent to him by World Bank in that country. So when I got to know, I told them, tell whoever has assigned that man, let him face his job, attend church on Sunday like any normal believer. They can give him one or two chances to preach. But if he dare takes over that he wants to run the administration, the church is going to close down. It's going to be doomed. The man said, no, 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 no. We've done this before. I said one of them is going to suffer. There are countries you can do it when there's already establishment, but there are countries where you have to put 24-7 focus, energy, time for the church to stand. That any small shaking, it can shake the church and that's it. There are some countries that are like that. And we have so much that of that kind, so much in East Africa. So, so much in East Africa because our foundations are not so much grounded into the church grooming like it is in some parts of West Africa like Nigeria. Some parts of Nigeria, you cannot compare the two. So in East Africa, any silly move can just shut down the church and empty it. The cultures are different, reasoning capacity is different, the way people see things are different, which is very different from the way it is done in Nigeria. So if you think you want to bring how things are done the other side to impose it, that is what is causing many things to crash. So that is now the battle that happened to that place. The man ran, changed structures, changed everything. Meanwhile, as he's doing it, he did not know that he was also hitting his World Bank project. As the church was suffering, his project also started suffering. That's why things of God, one has to be careful. Because, you know, there are places where to win one soul, <laughs> to win just one soul like this, it is work. Now, God has helped man that some souls have been won and are being groomed and are growing from childhood. You now want to bring your grandma that you have money. So the demon of Momo now took over that man. He was now speaking money more than the message. He was saying, I'm going to bring money. I'm going to pump money. I'm going to bring money. Pump money. Then God said, you want to pump money in what I've established. I want to see how you're going to pump your money. Started locking. Started having issues with his project. They started attacking him. They rose up against him. At the end of the day, the project was terminated prematurely. You know, you can sign a, world, a project with World Bank, but the country where you're going to do that project that World Bank is sponsoring, you are still under their control. So that country has the right to stop and terminate it. World Bank is not going to hit them. The best World Bank will do is stop the project and hold the money. So eventually, the man got to know that I had, you know, sent, of course, in the first time when he had, he got angry, spoke a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff, and I told them one of them will suffer or both of them will suffer. Because you can't match the two, God and Mammon, you can't. It is it's, it's, it's not there, it doesn't happen. Of course, the God guy got angry, sent tough messages. Me, I was quiet, very quiet. Those days, I was very tiny. Now, I've put on so much weight, very tiny, like a stick like this, that if you blow, I could even go by the wind. But after about six months, they saw manifestation. The man now started saying, well... You see the devil, the devil is not sleeping. I say, yes, the devil has never slept. But the children of God are sleeping, unfortunately. And his target is the children of God who are not praying and vigilant. He says, you see the devil, the devil, it was the devil's work. So now what do we do? I said, no. To hit that place back is going to be work. Go back to those who handed it over to you. Let them see the solution. The solution, me, I was only giving advice as a person who knows 
how s how we behave in the region. At least every East African knows how a Kenyan behaves, a Tanzanian, Rwandese, Burundi, and a Ugandan. We know South Sudan. We know how how we, how we behave. So even though we don't know 100%, but at least the 40, 50%, 60 we know can save you from something if they if they take time or bother to listen. So here there's a warning. You can't have two masters. You can't say you've been sent to a particular place to run a project that's supposed to mint money, and then you're going to say you're going to run the church at the same time. That project you've been sent to mint money, you have to be in the field 24-7. In the church, for it to move well, you have to sacrifice 24-7. So what are you going to sacrifice for? That is what now our Lord Jesus Christ is trying to bring out. You cannot have, you cannot be one person in two places at the same time. Your heart goes where the treasure your heart goes where your treasure is. If the treasure that took you there was the money, you're not going to make the things that need the spirit to run. <laughs> they can't stand. They are two contrary things. So when we look at the word master in Greek, the word master in Greek is curious. This curious means Lord, Lord, or a person of authority. It means Lord or a person of authority. And the word serve in Greek is, <coughs> the word serve in Greek is duolio, duolio. Duolio means to subject and serve in subjection like a slave relationship. It is to subject and serve in subjection like a slave relationship. Because the word duolio is from the word duolos. So this duolos means to serve or a servant. So it is such a relationship of a slave-like relationship to the master. The slave obeys whatever the master tells him to do, whether it's comfortable or not, they obey. That's the slave. And the slave has been sold to that master. So that master is fully in control and in charge of that slave. In the olden days, when we look at uh, history, in the 18th, 17th century, 18th century, 16th century, how the whites came and bought slaves from Africa to work in their fields, in their farms. So the generations we see today of chaos and what in some parts of America, some parts of Europe, uh, the ones they call black Americans, some of them, their roots are from slavery of their fathers or mothers that were sold off into slavery. And the most painful thing that if you to compare what was given to the governments to sell their people to these people to work, it is so painful, so, so painful that you realize that ignorance is a terrible thing that one should ever suffer from. At least if you suffer from kwasha ko, you know it is a deficiency of protein. So you go and eat protein, you, go, you just go and um, upgrade your beans, you know, soak the beans in water one night, remove all the acidity in the beans. Then in the following morning, you wash, after soaking it the whole night, the following morning, you pour that water, wash those beans very well, then um, cook the beans halfway, pour that water because you're reducing acidity. Then after pouring that water, you put another fresh water after the beans is half cooked, and then you continue. By the time you eat your beans, there's no gas, no bloating, because you've reduced the acidity from 100 to about 20. So 20% acidity is not really bad, doesn't shake much as the 100%. So you just pump yourself with the beans, get your greens, your dodo, jobio, your nakati, mix it in your food, and you eat, 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 eat. The kwashako will go to reduce. But ignorance has to do with knowledge and understanding. They work together like this. That disease, if it is treated, you can imagine there was a documentary I was watching, one of the ancestors sold off, I don't even think he understood what he was doing, sold off his um, offspring in exchange of a mirror. Gave a mirror and the other ones gave him wine, um, not even wine, gin, an alcoholic drink in exchange. And the man was so excited, he saw it as a treasure. So once understanding is not there, what is valuable is taken away. It's taken away. This is the problem we are facing in East Africa now. The Middle East is buying our brothers and sisters as slaves. 
But the company is taking these people and not telling the people the truth that you have been bought as a slave. These are the cases we see on social media, crying on television. A person went to work. They promise them they'll pay them this amount of money. When they get there, the language changes. The company that bought them, that paid for them, holds their passports, no communication, no network, no phone. And when the person works after a month, they begin to wait for the salary, no salary. Meanwhile, the people back home are expecting money. They have sold all the little they have to send their child to go and get money to run the family. The child has gone under the umbrella of deception. The child has landed in deception, has been received in deception. And all the work of the years they are there, it's deception. Some of them, there are some who are paying, there are some who are not. But the majority are falling in the hands of those who are not paying. And the most painful thing, they are tortured so badly, they are not treated well. When they ask for the pay, they, the people tell them, no, we already paid the company that gave you, we paid for you for two years. That is already slavery. You've been paid as a slave. One, is, you know, uh, slavery is buying and selling. You use your own money to buy yourself into the company. Then the, 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 you use your own money to sell yourself to the company exporting you. Then the company receiving you the other side is buying you from this company that is sending you. And all these lies, you know, all these lies, the people doing it are forgotten that as long as they have children, they will be treated the same way. Karma, karma will always give back what you gave it. It doesn't matter how long it gives back. So that's why we see some of these children acting in a strange way. Some children, when they grow up, they go wayward, they are confused, no counseling, no grooming, no nothing, puts them back to order. Because what their fathers and mothers did is now coming back to them in good measure, pressed down, shaken together, turning over, and men giving back to their bosom. So this slave trade is a serious issue. So the way a person operates as a slave, the person is owned, controlled, and directed by one master. So the one who has already solved, when the person is received the other side, this company has no voice. And that's why when the parents here start saying, our child is sick, almost dying, you company that took the child, why don't you bring the child? What do the company say? We finished our part. Which part did they finish that they did not tell you in the beginning? It's the slave. Because it is a buy and sell, buy and sell. There's a documentary they showed in Al Jazeera some time back, I think about last year towards the end. They were showing how slave trade is booming in East Africa, Africa, but mostly East Africa to the Middle East. And the Arabs were like, yes, this is our business, this is our trade. Some of them even export them further to European countries. And these people don't know what is happening. They have just been paid. They are, some who have been just paid to go and sleep with animals. That's what they have been paid. But the company is doing the transaction. They even sometimes they may not know, or even though they know for them, they are after money. So, when Satan now is at work, there's no way you're going to serve God and serve Satan. This is what Jesus is saying. You can't serve two masters. When the person has bought as a slave, because we are looking, we are looking at um, serve in the original Greek, and then master also in the original Greek. So that serving is talking about one who is subject and serving subjection like a slave relationship. You obey your master. Whatever the master tells you to do, you do. Whatever your master says, you, you, you follow. A slave is one person. And this is the context that the Lord Jesus Christ is speaking uh, it from, that the Lord is your master. Serve him and only him and no one else. Because a slave does not have two masters. He only has one master. Another company, two companies cannot run one slave. It's only one company that has purchased that slave that has the power and authority over that slave. Even the company that directed the slave to the one who has bought the slave no longer has the voice after the contract has been closed and has received that slave. So Jesus is saying he's the master. We are the slave. We are supposed to serve him. Not look at any other but him and him alone. And if Satan is the master of anyone, you cannot serve the two at the same time. So if man has become your God, you're not going to say you're going to love the Lord your God with all your heart because you've put that money as your Lord in your heart. So the two masters cannot work together. You can't serve two masters at a go. One has got a divided heart, and a divided heart will have a divided loyalty. A divided loyalty will have a divided commitment. So they cannot commit. They are not certain. They are not sure. 
So these are things that we need to ponder upon. When one is serving, they are devoted. They are devoted. And this devotion we are talking about means that you will serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is uh, the most important and first law that was stated in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Deuteronomy 6, verse 5, it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So the Lord put a seal of this approval. He put a seal on this approval uh, because he's the author of the law. He's the author of that law, of that commandment. So he put a seal and he emphasized it in the New Testament. That the, and even changed uh, the 613 commandments that were there were changed to 10 on the mountain when um, Moses met with God, the burning fire. So the 10 were reduced to 2. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and all thy strength. And you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. So the last six have to do with human beings. The, la the first four have to do with God Almighty. So they were compressed into two, which are the first and the greatest that our Lord Jesus Christ talks about. The first and greatest law that Jesus talks about. So when you look at all this, the Lord put the seal on that. He emphasized, he laid emphasis to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. He says this is the first and the greatest law. So spring, which means the idol, uh, the idol comes in between, uh, that mammon, if it's to come in between, your relationship with God will not be committed, will be divided. Loyalty will not be there. Because you're considering, remember, the treasure, the treasure that you hold on to is what the heart holds on to. So if your heart 24-7, money, 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 I need to get money, you're everything money, you dream money, you're running mad, it has now become your God, you can do anything to get the money. You don't care about your name integrity, you don't care whether it hurts another person or it destroys another person, all you're up to is I have to get this money, I don't care at all costs. That's the mammon demon we are talking about, that wants to amass wealth, that wants to be in control, that wants to gather, does not care where it's coming from. You cannot do that in that attitude and then you say you love God. It is impossible. It is impossible because your mind is so much taken up by that and there's no way you're going to put your mind to focus on God because these two things we are talking about, you need to focus. You need to put your focus onto it. So when you look at the husband, the wife, the parents, no husband laid his life for the wife and the reverse. No parent laid their life for their children and reverse. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who did that. So if we are to learn to go back to the one who laid his life for us, the one who is the author and the finish of our faith, the one who is the owner of life and breath, we now serve him and face him. The Bible tells us the rest will follow us. So put your entire heart, your commitment, facing the Lord Jesus Christ. Then the rest that you need, that you desire, will follow you. That's what the Bible is talking about. So that's why um, when somebody is, 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 is very sick, even though they don't go to church, they don't have any attachment to fellowship, they've not given their lives to Christ, they're in hospital, helpless, hopeless, no help, no strength at all. At one time they had the money, they enjoyed all the money. But you see, there is something I have learned about life. You see this human body, we can toss it the way we want, do it the way we want. It will allow you. The day it says your 40 days are finished, this one day is mine. No matter how, in, how you think you have power, you can fail to get up of that bed. Even how the person has power and money, you can fail to get up from that bed when the, the sickness, when the body has said, it is my turn. Stay here, you're not going anywhere. Those are the people who say, ah, I cannot breathe, my legs are weak. I cannot lift up my leg. Have you ever seen them carry a man who is arrogant, big, huge, helpless? That is to tell us that this life we carry, there's another force that is greater than us, greater than our actions, greater than our decisions that can put us down and silence us. There was a case we had gone to, you know, do prayers for. The man was so arrogant, rude, so full of attitude some years ago that even he doesn't respect his wife among people, the man fell sick. When the wife used to go to church, you say those churches you go to, those useless churches, what? The woman, he told her, if I catch you going there, you will see. I told the woman, listen to your husband, because your subject there, that's where you're married, he's your head. She said, that pastor, I said, listen to him, stay there and pray at home. God one day will visit him. When the man fell sick, 
He was no longer saying rubbish churches. He was no longer saying it. Is that not telling the wife? The other church you used to go to, I hear they pray too much. Uh, have you told them that I'm not well? The same man who didn't want to know. So a time comes when that body realizes it is no longer I. There's one master. That's why you can find people in the hospital. They have never confessed Christ as Lord and Savior, but they'll say one thing, Mukama Nyambe, let God help me. Let God help me. Pray to your God. Why do they call God when there's a crisis? It shows us that at all capacity, we need to hold on to God. In all levels, we need to hold on to God. No matter who you are, no matter what you have, no matter what you earn, God, number one. With all your heart, mind, soul, strength, might, everything, hold on to him. Put your trust in him. Look at him as the author and finish of your faith. You're number one. When these people are dying, no matter how they say they love each other, nobody will call the wife, hey, wife, come and help me. Husband, help me. It is God they will call. God. God. Or they'll say, pray for us. Pray for us. Why do they say that? Because now they know they have reached their climax. They have no strength, no power to do anything. So that's why Jesus is telling us, can you put your focus in the right thing? Channel your energies to the right one who you should serve and focus. Don't allow the things. Why did he use money? Uh, because mammon is that demon that amasses wealth in the wrong way, greedy way, selfish way, gets it for itself, has nothing to do with the kingdom work and assignment. It's always about it, it, it amassing, getting, getting, getting. Now, why, does God, why is Jesus comparing mammon with God? It's a master. Mana is a master, it controls. It's a spirit, tough one. It can change a heart of a person. It can cause a person to be killed. It can cause what are these murder cases we see about going on? Find most cases it has to do with money. A person meets somebody, hits the person's head just to steal for money. So it is a master on its own. It controls. It governs. Why is the world in a total mess? Because there's a group of people who are selfish. They're after getting money. Some of the diseases we see as incurable diseases, research got their medication years ago and through the natural angle. The nature where are, these natural elements, ionic ions in the ground. Because God created the human body that it gets healed by the kind of food it eats. Now when man that was wicked got to understand that the food man eats can fix that body and make them whole and sound, they began to attack the soils. They started this thing way back. They began to attack the soils how? They designed chemicals that destroy those ions that are supposed to release healing to the body through the plants. When they destroyed the soils with those chemicals, they've now begun to release wrong seeds to change everything. Why? Money. So money is a master. So Jesus says you either serve that or serve that because everyone on average needs money. You need money. We need money. Things shift with money. But it should not be a God. It should not control you. It should not put your life in a way that you, you're looking at it as your all in all. Some people are like that, even in the church. You find when you talk about the gospel, mm, they hold, they have the money. They hold it like this, hold it like this, hold it like this, hold it like this, hold it like this. Their priorities are wrong. Their focus is wrong, off. They would rather give to please a person, but to win a soul consistently every month, make it as a routine, it is a problem. And if they are to give just a little, a little, a little, the day is coming. Jesus will question them. Jesus will question them. So this is what he's trying to tell us. Our focus should be on the right thing. First God. First God. Of course, the Bible says in the last days, there will be lovers of money. Lovers of money are those who do anything at any cost for money. But we should not be categorized in that group of the lovers of money. We should be more of lovers of soul, lovers of each other. And then the Bible says the rest will follow. That's what Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13. He talks about Everything, everything, but without love, you're nothing. So it takes us back to the foundation. The foundation of our salvation for the world to come is God. Loved his dear only and begotten son. That whosoever perishes, so whoever dies shall not perish but have everlasting life. So it all started with love. And he says you run it with love, maintain it with love of who? The Father, the God Almighty, the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, strength, 
will, emotions, take it all in there. That's the mind, that's the soul, the will, the emotions. Take it all there from the depth of your heart and love him. That's the message he's giving us. So when we get to Deuteronomy chapter 12, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Let's read Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. And now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. It's a heart matter. It's a soul issue. The really we is the soul. Because that's where the, our will sits, our emotions sit, the soul. Where does the soul sit in the human organs of the body? The heart. That's why I say the heart and with the soul. The soul is the spiritual. The soul is the heart is the physical, where all these things are kept and stored. So he say you shall love the Lord thy God. God knows that Israel desires money. God knows that Israel that time desired development. They needed settlement. They needed to be established. But he was telling them first things first. Fear the Lord your God. And the Bible says the fear of the Lord is beginning of what? Wisdom or knowledge. So when you fear the Lord, you're beginning to have knowledge. Knowledge works with understanding. So when you know, you will not mess up. You know what to do at what time and when. That's the knowledge. You have understanding, clear understanding. They work together. And the Bible tells us understanding what establish the heavens. So all these things work together. They are spirits. They are spirits. They work together. So he's desiring for service from the heart, not from the eyes, not from the lips. Many of us have a lot of drama. You see the pastor is when you become active. When the pastor is not there, you become something else. But you forget you have a master above. Who is looking at you? Who is watching over you? So if we have that mindset that I'm not doing this for anybody, pastor there or not, the leader there or not, serve knowing you're serving the Lord your God, not the person. The person you're trying to, to please is a mortal being like you who is prone to error and mistake just like you. So put your heart, your focus to God. Tune it to God. Face him. Because he's your shield, he's your protector, he's your buckler, he's your provider, he's the one of breath in that life. So if we turn our hearts to give to him, God knows whatever we desire, whatever we need. He knows. He knows. He knows that at this period of time you need this amount of money to sort out this problem. He knows. He knows that after one year this incident is going to happen. He knows. That's why some he reveal in the dream for them to counter. Some will reveal it in the dream for them to be strengthened, that it cannot be reversed because it has to happen. That is God. But when we show him we love him and we practically do it and it's coming from the bosom of the belly of our heart, we can never lack or be stranded. God's word cannot come in vain. God takes care of his own. He takes care of his own. So the soul is related to absolute what? Loyalty. We need to train that soul. No other gods, nothing else takes up the place. In the Old Testament, um, serving means burning, burning incense, uh, burning burnt offerings. That's why um, Job kept burning. The Bible says he kept offering sacrifices, kept giving a burnt offering, kept going back to God. I repent, but venture my children have wronged you or done anything. He kept doing it and doing it and doing it. So you don't serve other gods when you are serving your God. You're serving without distraction. There's no distraction in that service. Let us go to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. We see something there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. And this I say for your own profit, that... And this I say for your own profit, not that I may put a lash on you, but for what is proper, and you may serve the Lord without distraction. So Apostle Paul is also bringing it out that you may serve the Lord without any distraction. Remember, this is a man who got revelations, abundant revelations, and he says was Satan buffeting him because of the revelations he got. You know, he went deep into the realms of the spirit. And now he's coming back to tell us that for your own profit, for our own benefit, for our own benefit, not that I may put a lash on you, but for what is proper and that you may serve the Lord without distraction. Put your focus. Let us put our focus on him. Let us not allow things to distract us. Say, 
the, the man disappointed you, promised to marry you, and he did not marry you. Now you're sad, you're sulking, you don't want to fellowship in church, you don't want to, to fellowship uh, the groups of the Bible study you used to do because the man uh, who, who promised, who deceived you that he's going to marry, has not married, he has got another one. Then you're angry, you're sulking, you walk, you put on your short dress, you do what you have to do with your all effort, no man is looking at you, no man is sighing at you, you get angry, God, what have I done? What is wrong with me? I am tired. I'm not going to church again. It's, you're not, you're not, if you don't go to church, it's for your own loss. Billy Graham's wife, she's, she was speaking one time and said, you know she died before Billy Graham. She said she got seven disappointments from men. Seven disappointments before meeting the eighth, who is Billy Graham. She said the seven men she was hurt, disappointed. Seven promised to marry her. But according to God, that were, those seven men were not her husband. But she said when she met Billy Graham, she thanked God that the seven men rejected her. So we need to look at things differently. Now you can imagine a wife of Billy Graham. A man who was always in the rames, 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 rames. His focus is Jesus. Not women, not waist, not bums, not skirt. Jesus. So some of us, our priorities are so wrong, you're crying over what you know is already a problem. Some women know the men they are crying for are womanizers. They know, but they still cry. Hey, you promised to marry. You say, but the man is a womanizer. Yes, but you promised. You mean that block cannot even make you see? So this is what Jesus said. Put your focus on him. Put your focus on him, your heart, your soul, your will, everything. He will show you. He will show you. Remember last Saturday we learned about the eyes. When those eyes of the understanding are open, the Amplified brought it out so well. The heart receives the light. He will now show you your calling. Your calling has an attachment to do with this one you're going to end your life with, your spouse. If your calling has been revealed to you by God, he can delay to give you one until you have matured and then he aligns you to the one who is supposed to support your calling. Because we rush and get what does not support the calling, then we run back to God and say, God, why did you give me this man? Why didn't you ask him before you settled? This is the battle we are facing. Many men are marrying women who are not their spouses. They are marrying their enemies. So their real calling that God has given them, they cannot see it because now their eyes have been turned to focus on things that are not bringing light to them. So these are things, areas that the Lord wants us to ponder upon. Put your focus. Put your focus in things that matter that will build you and make you have a close relationship with the owner of light. That will make you have the close relationship with the owner of life. A close relationship, a bond with him. Whatever you need, he knows. He will provide and give it to you. And that's why I tell people, hey, this one, leave it. It shows it is not meant for you. God knows why and he has a reason why. At times we want to do things our way, then put God on a corner. You can't put God on a corner and say, God, okay, if you don't do this for me, I'll do this. You give, start giving God ultimatums. Who are you to give God ultimatums? Who are you to give him ultimatums? If he's to decide to face you according to how he spoke in the word, would you stand to face that question? So we need to fear God. We need to do things with sense and understanding. We need to do things avoiding distractions. Let us not allow those things to, to drain you. Don't allow them. Somebody disappointed you, and now you want to show the person that I'm better than you. Then the person goes ahead of you. You now get sad. Eh, it shows you're still in the flesh and confusion is still in your life. You have not yet understood who you are. It shows the Christ you call. The light that is in you is filled with darkness. That's the scripture we read last Saturday. It shows that the light that you have has darkness in it. So push out all that darkness so that the light remains inside. So this is one of the battles that are causing people not to serve him with the whole their heart, their soul, their mind. That is the problem. That's the problem. So we need to behave like the, the sunflower. We need to behave like the sunflower. As we serve God without distraction, when you look at the sunflower, it faces the sun. 
just like the angels in heaven, don't face anything. They do only that which their God has told them to do. Those, they do not take their eyes away from God. Focus. What do we learn from the sunflower? The sunflower always looks at the sun. When the sun moves to the east, the sunflower will face to the east where the sun is. When the sun moves to the west, the sunflower will move to the west. Its direction, its lead is the sun. When the sun sets, it goes back to the position where it started from to wait to see which direction is the sun going to set and it picks up from there. That's how we are supposed to be. That's how amazing God has made his creation. So in the dream, if you've been dreaming of sunflower, God is not telling you go and farm sunflower or go and do business of sunflower because all of us when the mammon uh, spirit has taken over, anything you see, you just jump into it, jump into it, jump into it. Ah, God is telling me to do this. God is telling you, can you put your focus? Be like the sunflower. Let your whole heart be on me. Serve me with all your heart, with all your mind. Meaning, you're serving him but with portions. You're partially serving him. That's why he's showing you the sunflower. And some people, you know at times they put us also on, on, on corner. And, and, and they're allowed because we're all mortal. Somebody will come and tell you, Pastor, I got this dream. And I know what God is saying. We are listening. I know God is telling me to go and invest in this thing. So they have already put you on the corner. They've already locked you. They've shut you. So I've come for you to pray and bless me over this thing. You cannot say, are you sure that's what God is telling you? They have already cornered you. So your own is follow instruction. They have said, I have come for you to pray. Remember, you're a servant. So you behave. Okay, let us humble ourselves and we pray. Father, she has said, oh, they have said, you said this, let your mercy go ahead. Let your mighty hand and power go according to what you said. So that you don't say, Pastor, I came and you prayed. I always say, when I prayed, what were the words I used? Because when you say, but when you come and say, I got this dream. I was saying this and that. I've come for guidance. What do you think it means? Then you'll get the right direction. Then you'll not misfire. Some people have gone into sunflower business in terms of being an oil dealer, agent of the sunflower companies. Some have gone into the physical planting of the sunflower and they've come out with disappointment. And what will they say? But I prayed and God showed me a dream. What was the interpretation of the dream? Did you interpret it right? Or you assumed? So many of us do things out of assumption, but if you've been dreaming dreams of sunflower, sunflower, God is telling can you put your focus? You have a lot of distractions around you. Can you behave like the sunflower? Then he shows you a full field of sunflower, the garden. And he shows you moving there, you see the sun, but you don't pay attention on the details of the dream. For you, after you saw the sunflower, you just got up and said, God, I thank you. I'm going to start the business. You go and get a loan. You get a loan, the only small property you've worked for for years and saved, you put it as security. When the thing misfires, you say Satan has come, witchcraft, attack, da, da, da. After some time, the loan you got, interest has accumulated. The loan you saved for years goes. You go back to square one. Why? You did not have understanding. You did not put focus. Distractions came in and out, came in and out. You did not hold on to understand what is God communicating and saying. That's why all these dreams you get, you have, to, you have to look for the detail. What is the major message in that dream? Don't jump out and rush. Think deeply about it, deeply about it before you can take or make a conclusion. So like the way the angels and all the beings in heaven always behold the holy God. And as long as they keep looking at him, the light from the Lord God comes and comes upon them. Because the Bible says he's the father of lights. So that light that they keep facing, looking at him, the light also reflects upon them. So when they go, they go out flooded with that light that has reflected on them. So that's why when these angels appear to us, the same light comes upon you because they have got it from the Father of lights. So the light in heaven washes, it cleanses, it refines, it cuts, it chisels. 
Why? So that we have for that uh, all the impurities in our lives that have been existing are removed. They are taken away. So all this helps us to break anything that is hard, shatter anything that is what. That's why a person can tell you, I got a dream that they got a dream. They were in the deep pit. In the pit there was darkness, thick darkness. And then they saw uh, people praying and all of a sudden a light, bright light came and hit them from the pit and they came up. So it's telling us light has got the power to take everyone out from the darkest deep and bring them out. That's the power of the light that we are looking at. So you say the one who is the father of those lights, can you focus, pay your attention, put all your focus and face that man without any distraction. The one who owns the lights is the father of all lights. Mention any kind of light, he's the father of them all. Meaning is the one who produces, the one in charge, is the one who gave birth to all those lights. So the one who produces the lights has the capacity to, to take them off because he's the one who created them, he knows. It's just like the manufacturer. He manufactures something, he knows where he puts the secret chip, the what. So some things can happen, you go to a mechanic, he doesn't know, you have to go back to the manufacturer and inform them that this is what is happening, then they will tell you. So it is a similar thing that this scripture is telling us or what the Bible is telling us here. So the light has what? Purifying properties. Even at times when you're praying for somebody who has the spirit of death on them, when you're rebuking death and you're commanding them to come out from the pit of the dead, as they are being pulled out, the first thing they see, light first has to hit, bring them out. They say that the light came, hit them, and then they saw a hand that is full of light, Pull them out of that pit. That is our Lord Jesus Christ. Brings them back to life. So this light that we have to put focus on is the light God wants to beam from our hearts. He wants it to come from the depth of our hearts. He wants it to light from us that we love him truly in loyalty, in truth, not hypocritically, not pretending. Loving him from the depth of our heart. That love that nothing can separate you from him. That love that no distraction can push your movie away from your routine of what you're doing with him and for him. That love for him that it is his number one. That before even you say yes, you first think, is God in this thing? Will God be pleased? Does this thing please God? That kind of love that before you take a step of anything, God is number one. That man you've been waiting for for years, that woman you've been waiting for for years to marry, what are the indicators you see in them? Will they take you off the light? You can see it. You can see some signs. You can tell. You can tell. And mostly when they dodge and they don't want to, you know, attend the church or go to church, they give one reason or the other, criticize, run away. Run away. You know the end is going to be destruction. So this is what now uh, caution wants us to see. We have to be careful and be firm. Careful and be firm. Because the light in heaven washes, it cleanses, it refines, it cuts, it chisels. So that all impurities that exist are removed from those angelic beings that are around God. And the beings in heaven, as long as they keep looking unto God, it purifies them, it cleanses them. And the Bible says Jesus is the light. You know, that song we sing, light of the world, you step down into darkness, open my eyes and let me see. So that light that is Jesus, he wants us in his heart. He wants us to put our focus on the Father who is the Father above him. In John 10, he says, I and my Father are one. John 10, 30 says, I and my Father are one. But in verse 28 and 29, he says, I and my Father are one. That when the Father gets you and you, you, put, you hold on to him, he will not allow anyone to snatch you out of his hand or pluck you out of his hand. So now the Father who is the father of lights, is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who was the Christ, but Jesus came on earth as Jesus. It's a title. So Jesus coming in on earth, he comes in under the order and instruction of the father of lights. He says, me and my father are one. So if him and the father are one, he's saying the light that is in the father is the light in him. So when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, we allowed him as the Lord and personal Savior in our hearts, we confessed him. We now begin to walk the journey to be like him, to be crucified. Uh, because now as we start walking the journey, that's why after you give your life to Christ, it's better to, it's good to have understanding why you're doing some things. That's why now we start the foundation class. Now when you've done the foundation class, you're getting to understand 
what is the word? What is the Holy Spirit? What is salvation? Baptism. They teach about baptism, the importance of baptism. Jesus himself had to come and be baptized. And he said to fulfill all righteousness. But he had the power and capacity not to be baptized. And the Bible says as he was being immersed in the water by John the Baptist, the, uh, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove from heaven and came upon him. And then the voice came from heaven. This is my beloved son that our father was speaking about in whom I'm well pleased with. So all these things are very important that you know and understand. Immediately you give your life to Christ, there's that foundation class. You make sure you start it and finish it. By the time you finish that class, then you're taken for water baptism. What does that mean? I die with, I'm crucified with Christ and I resurrect with him. What does that mean? From that day, you begin to walk a life leading the path of our Lord Jesus Christ, walking towards having a character nature of Christ, making sure that anything about the flesh goes down, that the spirit will rule and take over, that your human spirit has control over the soul, has control over the flesh. When the flesh says this, the spirit says no. Because you are crucified with him. And then as you keep to journey, you now get to understand that, oh, when I was crucified with him and I was raised with him and Jesus was raised back, went back to the father from the grave, he went and he seated at the right hand of the father. That means I am seated together with him because I was crucified with him and I was raised with him through the baptism. So now you now come to a point and understand that, oh, it is after that baptism, I am now seated together with Christ. I am seated together with him. You are joint heirs with him him. So you begin to have a joint heir with Christ. So everything you do, do with the consciousness, knowing you're seated together with him. Your position with him, you are together. So that way, demons cannot come and torment you because you know you're seated with light. And when that light is next to you, it also becomes and reflects on you. So you carry the light. You move with the light. It goes with you. You walk with it. It talks with it. The actions reflect that light. So that's what he wants us to do. Let us put our focus there. Put tune our mind there. It will affect our attitude positively. It will affect everything about us positively. So this light purifies us. It cleanses us. It doesn't, doesn't stop there. It also continues to fill us with the goodness and the love of God. So this love now cannot be penetrated, cannot be polluted, cannot be used against in any form because this love is incorruptible. It's incorruptible. When it enters, it enters. Nobody can change it. That's why some people get to a certain point where even the people around them do not matter. Because they have loved the Lord, the God, and they've come to realize I was only a channel to bring another set of people into the world. But it's about me and the Father. And that's why when you read some scriptures in John, it says that the Christ who was in heaven and the Christ is here. Meaning there's a duplicate but you are backed up by that one there to fulfill the purpose why you're here on earth. So why are you here? The eyes of the understanding has to be opened. And now if it is open, what next? You give your life to Christ. Serve God, not mammon. He says that there is a Christian who will either serve God or a mammon. So where you are, you're either serving mammon or you're serving God. What are you serving? Who are you serving? So that is something we need to ponder upon. That's why all the angels and all the beings in heaven, they reflect on the goodness of God. So we need to practice that too. We should not allow distractions. We should not allow any attachments. We should serve the Lord, our God, with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our soul. Single-minded devotion. Very, very important. So that is it about the Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. So the next time we meet by the grace of God, we shall handle the Matthew chapter 6 from verse 24. 25 to 34. Matthew chapter 6 from verse 25 to 34. And, and that one uh, tells us that um, it's the best part in the entire Sermon of the Mount. It's the best bit of the entire Sermon of the Mount because it has a very personal relationship, a personal attachment, and a personal bonding that each one of us has to key into. Once we came to that personal bonding and that attachment that our Lord Jesus Christ wants us to see, it will help us so much to put our focus, tune our energies to God Almighty, and we shall know what we are up to. Some of us are in salvation, but we don't know what we are up to. You ask the person, uh -huh, what is it? I'm just there. Uh, I'm just there. Uh, when God allows, how can you be just there? 
uh, Ephesians chapter 1, 18, uh, Apostle Paul was praying that the eyes of the understanding may be enlightened, that they may know the hope of the glory of their calling. You, you're saying, I'm just there, I'm just there, I'm just there. So when you're just there, everything about you will also be just there. Everything will just be there. So we need to change our attitude and, and understand what the scriptures are saying so that we put them into practice. And then we do not become, you know, uh, the category that Jesus was talking about when he says, you go away, I don't know you. You know, that should not be our portion, should not be our Lord. And the Lord will continue to help us and hold us. You know, that, that particular bit is so deep. I, we shall start it by the grace of God the coming Saturday. And I know the Lord in his mercy shall help us as he continues to open our eyes of understanding that we may be enlightened, that we may know the hope of the glory of our calling, the reason why we are here, the purpose. You know, many people in the world keep saying, I'm, I'm looking for purpose. These days now, look at anyone in social media, anyone who is popular, they'll tell you, I'm looking for purpose. I'm looking for purpose. But how can you find purpose without the origin of purpose? The origin of purpose is in God. The origin of purpose is in Christ Jesus. So where are you going to get it when you've not allowed him to become part of you? So there's no way you're going to see it unless your eyes of understanding open. And the eyes of understanding is the heart. The heart carrying the light of God. That's the eyes of the understanding. So once we have that opened into us, it will align us to do the right thing, focus, put us to focus onto the things that build and matter. At times we spend a lot of time onto things that don't matter, that don't build, things that are non-issues. But when we put our focus on things that matter and build, God is faithful. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. He said, I will not allow anyone to snatch you from my hands. Do you know how deep that scripture is? Do you know how so marvelous that scripture is? It means a lot, a lot, a lot. It is very gross, very, very gross. So once you have understanding of that, there is no way, there is no way anything will just come and put their head on you, try and attack, try and do this. It is no way because God says he will not allow them to snatch you off his hands, meaning his 24-7 surveillance, protection, keeping watch, you know. That's what he's trying to tell us. So, beloved, I want us to be hearers of the word and then do it. You hear the word and do it. Don't just be hearers only, be doers of the word. When we become doers of the word and we love this Bible, we love this Bible, this wonderful treasure, the gift of God without measure. When we have this in our hearts, beloved, there's nothing that is going to shake us on this world. And where we are going now, things are becoming tough. Things are becoming tough. Things are shifting because prophecy has to be fulfilled. What was written in scripture, most of it is being fulfilled. So now, beloved, when we do that, we, shall, we, we need to be firm and hold on to God and know what we are up to. We should not take anything for granted. We should not take anything for granted at all, at all, at all. And once we hold the fort, for the Lord is coming, Jesus will help us. So you're there, you've never given your life to Jesus, but you only follow people online or just follow different preachers online. This is an opportunity for you. There is no way you're going to have that light shine in you. And there's no way you're going to make the Lord your God, your master, without accepting the son Jesus that he sent, who died for us all, and reconcile that, that you may reconcile man to God. You're not going to have that serving and say you love God. And you know God loves you when you do not accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior in your heart. So I want you to repeat after me and say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you died on the cross for me. With my mouth, I confess that you are Lord over my life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for loving and accepting me. Father, I commit and connect your children into thy hands, King of glory. As they are boldly confessed as Lord and Savior, Father, accept them, King of glory. Keep watch over them. Any condition from their foundation, we counter that condition by the power of the Holy Ghost. Let your light continue to so shine upon them in the name of Jesus. Hold their hand and walk with them in the mighty name of Jesus. We count anything contrary that may want to rise up against them, King of glory. Let your shield of protection overshadow them 24-7 in the name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. Beloved, Keep in touch with us. Our numbers are online. We have an online foundation class. Very important to be part of this class. It will help you. It will help you grow. It will make you come out of any doubts. You have deep understanding about some things, about uh, major topics on salvation, baptism, why baptism is very important, why salvation is very important, um, 
the reason why you gave your life to Christ, the revelation of Jesus Christ normally comes within that, you know, salvation, the Holy Spirit. What is the role of the Holy Spirit? Why must we embrace the Holy Spirit? Uh, we also taught about the word and prayer. What is Why is it important for you to read your Bible every day? If you want to grow, you have to read your Bible and pray every day. These are songs that you used to sing or you hear people sing, read your Bible and pray every day, pray every day, pray every day. Read your Bible and pray every day if you want to grow. Uh, that is the only way for growth spiritually is read your Bible and pray every day. So other topics, you know, the creation of man, the fall of man. All this is very important for you to know and understand. And this will help you strengthen and be firm. And the Lord will continue to help us and hold our hands. My Lord and my God, we want to thank you, everlasting Father. We bless your name. Daddy, be thou exalted in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray, King of glory, that your mighty power, your works, your glory, your goodness, rule and take charge in the name of Jesus. We count anything contrary that may want to rise up against us, King of glory. Power, Father, we pray that your power and your presence continue to speak forth in the mighty name of Jesus. We release your fire, we release your power, release your unction. Let it speak forth by the power of the Holy Ghost in the mighty name of Jesus. I cover everything about us with the blood of Jesus. Let the glory, honor, the power, the presence of the Almighty God rule and take charge in the mighty name of Jesus. Almighty Father, we say thank you. King of glory, Almighty God, we bless your holy name. I cover, I seal, and I soak every one of us with the blood of Jesus and the fire of the Holy Ghost. In Jesus' mighty name, we prayed. The Lord keep you. The Lord bless you. Let his face shine upon you. Let his goodness and mercy overshadow you. In the mighty name of Jesus, it is well with you. God bless you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Have a pleasant weekend.